Welcome everyone to the June Civic CRM Campfire Chat. We're going to be talking about sending out uh, mass emails through Civi CRM using Civi Mail and Mosaico. And I'm going to turn it over to the presenters. So just one second. Go ahead, Matt. You're you're a host, and you should be able to share your screen. Can please mute yourselves. Um, that would be great. I am hearing some background noise. So, so the background noise may be my my children. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got a microphone here, but um, if you hear any some children in the background, then um, it's a little bit difficult to mute them sometimes. But um, <laughs> my, my my name's uh, yeah Matthew Wire from MJW Consulting, and um, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of um, what Mosaico is and uh, what it what it does for you with CVCRM, um, and um, and give you an idea of where where things could go with CVCRM in the future. Um, there's a couple of things that um, might be might be coming along depending on on, on funding and development um, uh, availability. Um, so Mosaico. Um, has been available for Civi CRM now for probably nearly nearly four or five years, um, and um, and what it is, it describes itself as a, a responsive um, email template ed ed editor. Um, at the time, it was probably the only open source um, sort of system of, it, of its type, and um, and effectively, I, I think it was built to it was built by an Italian firm to compete with. Um, things like MailChimp and, and things which provide a nice graphical drag and drop interface for um, for, for composing emails and, and automatically handles the responsive side of things. Um, so, and we keep talking about responsive, um, for, for, for those of you that don't sort of, not familiar with that term, um, really it means that the emails look nice on um, on mobile phones and they look nice on large computer screens and, and tablets and everything in between. Um, traditional, you know, sort of a few years ago, web design didn't really focus on that, and email design took a little bit longer. And, and kind of, um, you, you need a something that claims to be responsive in order to um, to provide that that functionality. So, Mosaico is a library that um, they provide, and uh, they provide a demo here. And effectively, it allows you to drag blocks in and compose an email very rapidly, uh, compose a, a template for an email very rapidly. So, and uh, you can drop images in. Um, so, um, there should be a gallery there. Um, and um, there's no images on this one, but um, the, the idea is, is that uh, you can do this. So, so I'm, I'm using the demo directly on mosaico.io just to show you initially. Um, it's a demo that has nothing to do with CVCRM, but um, they, they provide that that demo and, and you can see you can you come in here you can edit text um, make it italic change the formatting um, etc so it was uh, Vida Consulting originally came along and built the Mosaico extension for CVCRM um, one of their clients I think funded it and had a need for for a, a more responsive editor um, so if we go to CVCRM now um, you can see we're here on the extensions listing. And on this particular site, I've got an extension here called Mosaico, which um, which is installed. And we're on the latest version. And little and the description says that uh, yeah, it's, it's um, integrates with the Mosaico templates builder and allows building messages using the, the Mosaico builder. So for those of you that don't have Mosaico installed at the moment, um, when you click on new mailing, you will see the traditional Civi mail. But when you do have it installed, which I have here, um, you, you now have two options. You have new mailing and you have new mailing traditional. And um, if we click on, click on traditional, then you will see the 
mailing composer that um, that you would have would have all been familiar with before before installing Mosaic. Um, just takes a moment to load, and um, you can see here you can enter your your HTML and plain text format. Um, not amazingly easy to use if you're not um, familiar with um, sort of editing HTML, and it's more difficult to to, to, you know, to to make things responsive because you need to consider putting sort of different sort of style formats and things in. Um, and to make things more complicated, uh, email clients such as Outlook, Gmail, um, your your favorite, you know, insert your, insert your favorite email client. Um, they support a relatively limited subset of of HTML, and and um, and there's you know there's very and they don't document it, so there's very little chance of um, of us really uh, being able to being able to handle that. And and the idea of these responsive editors is they handle that for you, and they will only put in the appropriate. Um, Sort of a markup that, that that is likely to work properly on the on the on the email clients. Um, so if we now load a new mailing with the Mosaic editor, and again, just taking a little while to load. This time, instead of seeing the HTML and the text fields, we see a set of selectable templates. And um, I'm just going to click on this last one for now. Um, and this this is where the, the body of your email was, um, where the, the content of your email. So we're going to click on this. And, um, and that now loads the Mosaic editor that we saw earlier directly into the CVCRM interface. And we can add, we can compose our email. Um, so, um, when I touch things, I mean, when I don't. See if we've got any images on here, and we've got no images on here, but you, you can drag and drop an image um, and um, let me just have a very quick look if I can see something suitable. Um, in fact, let's let's do it this way. Um, so. Okay, there we go. We have a cat. And um, and once you once you've initially uploaded that, you'll see that they then appear in the, in the in the gallery and. Um, Sorry, they appear in the recents. Um, if you want them to be in the gallery, you need to drag them there, I think. Um, so you drag them there and they would um, be able to add them. So you can build up a library of, uh, of images, um, for example, logos for your organization um, and um, or, or, a, or a gallery full of, full of cat pictures. Um, and you can compose your email. Um, once you, you're, you're happy with it, um, so we can configure formatting. Um, and that there's a limited amount of formatting available, but the idea is, is that all of these formats should be supported by the email client. And um, you, know, you, don't, you don't need to worry too much about that. You, you, can, um, you can just you know, uh, select what you want, and you can assume that it's going to um, appear reasonably well in, within the, um, the email client. There's, there's a mobile preview. So you can see what it's going to look like in both both cases, and you can see here, responsive format. We've we've now changed into image above the text um, for that particular size, and you can go bigger, and you can go bigger still. Um, so once you've composed something that uh, that you're happy with, um, you can you can test from directly in the editor, and um, and there's there's a sort of inline preview, um, which pops up like this and you can see yeah um, 
looks roughly as, as you can expect. But in order to test your actual email client, you can then send directly to your email to, to an email address of your choice. And um, you can also send to a group. So, so one thing a lot of organizations do is um, they will have a, a group of four or five people, um, which may well be part of their organization. It might be the marketing team or, uh, or an approvals team who, who would be in a particular group. So say um, in this case, we've got email group and you can send test and that will send it to all of those. Um, and if you send it to a group that also allows tokens and things to be tested properly, um, which some of these other options don't necessarily allow because it's, it's not in the right, not in the right context. Um, but, um, and when we talk about tokens, we're talking about the same CVCRM tokens that are available in, in, in most places uh, within CVCRM. So some, some fields, for example, the, the, the obvious one being the contact name um, so that you can you can write things like, um, uh, perhaps not quite like that. So, so you can say, dear, dear Matthew, um, and then the, the rest of the text. Um, once you're happy, you, uh, you, you close this and that, that effectively saves this, this email in the same way that, um, that you would before. So the, um, you don't get a preview at this point. You need to click edit if you want to preview it. Um, but you're now ready to enter subject, recipients, as you would before, um, and configure anything else that you would need to. And, and again, you can now you can send a test email. Um, and um, this particular system is not set up for actually sending email out. So um, you can see that's that's grayed out. And uh, and we don't actually have everything configured either. So. Um, but um, so we have to get, we have to fill in a couple of these parameters, and now we can send a test, but it won't actually it won't actually go anywhere in this particular case. But um, what would happen is you would get an email come into your inbox, which would look exactly like you would expect the recipients to um, of, of the final mailing to to get once you once you actually schedule it for sending, um, and um, if that gives you confidence that that they're going to actually see something useful, it allows you to check for typos and check that tokens are all put in there properly. Um, so one of the other functions of Zerko is that um, Roshani referred to, you know, that they'd had a custom template built for their organization and um, that there's a few organizations that I'm aware of that have, have done that whereby they uh, they might have some, some custom um, blocks and things. So, um, so, so, let, so, so let me explain what, what a block is as well. So um, Mosaico allows you, we, we've just been looking at the email editor um, and um, Mosaico allows you to create templates um, which are not linked to one specific email. So, so um, you might have um, a, a, um, a, an email that's going to, to all of your, 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 your donors and an email that's going to all of your um, uh, members and, uh, and you might have specific templates that you want to use for them and you could configure those here. So, so we click on Mosaico templates they come here and um, and you can create a new a new template um, and uh, so let's just uh, donors for example um, and you can see that here and it, it pops up it's actually the same editor um, the only difference is that you don't have the same level of preview and um, um, and and things here because we're building something that's then going to be used later in to drop into those into that um, that editor so. So we can um, we can do something here and, uh, and sorry, let's just okay. So you can you can pre-configure this um, and um, we can change we can change color schemes on a on a sort of global basis as well. So if we click here. You can choose whether you're working on the particular block or the um, overall. So we can have a, a light green background, for example. Um, and then once we're happy, we can save that. And that's now down here. And if we were to go to a new mailing, we're now able to select that template for use. Okay. 
and we can see there donors, the one that I've, I've just created. So that will now take that as a template and we can now edit it further for this specific email. And you can see here the changes that we made there. Any changes you make at this point are only going to apply to this specific email. And each time you start with this same template. One of the nice little extras, if you install another extension, which um, was was mentioned, called, uh, I think mentioned in the chat, which is called Mosaic Message Template, um, which you can also find here, Mosaic Message Template. Um, what it does is it automatically copies any of the templates that we've just created um, and puts them as as user user message templates that can be used for, for other things. So so um, that, that could be sent out as a, for example, Civi rules would allow you to send that via, um, via, via an email action. Um, you could actually send that and that gives you a sort of mosaic of formatted email. Um, it's a one-way sync. So you, you have to keep making the changes in mosaic and then pass it across to here. Um, I think I'm I'm about to to stop really because um, that's a sort of quick uh, overview. But what I just want to um, tell you a little bit about um, something that um, Civi Serum is taking part in the Google Summer of Code project um, this year, and um, but also um, myself and a, a number of other organisations. Um, Mikey from MJCO in in, in Wales um, is also very interested in um, something called MJML, which um, is something that was originally developed by Mailjet. Um, and it's another another type of markup um, which is used to compile emails. And um, it does, you know, there's, there's nothing for CVCRM yet, but it's something that um, would work in a similar way to Mosaic from from that point of view, but would would uh, be a lot more powerful um, because there's a lot more there's a lot of tools available um, to compose the emails. So so for example, this is a, a desktop editor. Sorry, this is an editor that could be embedded into CVCRM, and that's the the part of the Google Summer of Code that's that's hopefully happening this year, which which could then work in a similar way to Mosaic and give you the choice of between the two editors. But there's also, for example, there's a, there's a desktop app that uh, allows you to compose MJML directly. So a little bit like writing um, writing email templates directly in sort of in in, in a in a in a word processor or something. Um, and um, one of the really nice things is you can configure things so you can feed that via an API into your CV CRM installation or back out. Um, and um, and it would open up the possibilities for um, sort of, you know, for example, you might have a marketing team that don't even need access to CV CRM, but could still produce um, the, the email templates um, using a, a desktop app like this. And uh, and then your CV CRM team could, uh, could manage the scheduling and sending of those um, of those emails, um, which would be be quite good, but that's um, just a sort of um, an aside for something that could be coming soon. So I'm going to stop there. Invite any questions um, and um, and, uh, and and say thank you, and then we'll we'll move on to Rich. To Rich. Matt, you may have to make Rich the host. Okay. Um. Um, I don't know if you're taking questions over mic or just chat. Yeah, I thought. Ah, um, so I need to stop my screen share and then I can actually see, there we go, and I can see the rest of the hearing that's going on, right. <laughs> sure, um, I think we can take a question right now. If you want to yeah. go ahead and ask a question, in the meantime, uh, you can make Rich the host. Go ahead with your question. Okay, I, I asked it in the chat, but I was wondering if you could show um, what options are available for customizing um, unsubscribe links and footers, because that was, I had wanted to transfer to Mosaico from Civi Mail, but we have several different mailing lists um, and we like to, you know, provide an option to unsubscribe from this specific mailing list and also, you know, opting out of all emails, also like updating email preferences. And it didn't look like there was a lot of flexibility with the unsubscribe feature. Um, so, so I was yeah. Um, 
so Barry's just responded to say that yeah, the, the unsubscribe links are just tokens, and and um, and that, that that's correct. I mean, you, you can you can insert the standard CVCRM tokens um, anywhere you want within that email. The only issue I think with Mosaico is that um, the, there is a little header at the top which has an unsubscribe link in by default, um, and um, uh, but I think again that can be turned off if you if you click on the pre-header block, um, you can actually turn off the unsubscribe link by just setting it to none at that point. Um, and then insert your own um, um, sort of in, in the bottom. And one of the things that uh, I know we've done for a, a client before is actually build a custom block. So one of those blocks that you drag on that has, you know, one image or three images or image plus text. Um, we've had the, you know, a sort of custom, and I, and I think um, Plastic um, uh, Pollution Coalition also have something similar where um, they have a, a custom block that they drag onto each of the, the emails um, and contains their, their social media links and it contains the unsubscribe links and, um, and things. Um, okay, so any more questions or um, should, we, should, or should we move to Rich? Matt, there were a few questions in the shared document and I tried to pick out of the chat. Do you want me to read one or two of those? Yes, please, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so one of the questions, there's a few questions about the ability to search and organize images in the gallery, particularly if you've got lots and lots of images. Okay, so um, I don't believe there's any, there are actually, I don't believe there's any search options within the gallery. Um, there, there was a custom integration that somebody did for WordPress that, that effectively linked that gallery to um, to the WordPress um, sort of image gallery, I believe. And I think that was quite successful. It's not something I've used. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think effectively you load them into the gallery and then they're just um, there as a big uh, list of, of images. Um, correct, correct. If anybody else knows better, please do correct me. By the regular uh, mailings, you can um, access your files and there you can delete uh, images if you want. So via the traditional mailings. So that's a way of managing your image gallery. Okay, and, and I can see I can see the, the other questions here. So um, how do you create custom based templates? Um, so the, the um, effectively the the template, the base templates exist as as a sort of HTML um, um, file, um, which which you can modify. But it's it's slightly it has some slightly sort of custom. Um, but basically, they they they, they developed a um, something called HTML, which is a sort of markup language. Um, the um, Civi's inter integration is a few versions behind. So um, the, the 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 MML. The HTML MML editor. Um, I'm not sure if that is fully effective. But we, we've always um, edited the base templates directly and, and then tested them out. Um, yeah, the, changing the thumbnail images of the templates. I think that's a, a sort of feature request that's been asked a few times, but um, it's it's not um, not possible at the moment, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, we talked about moving the unsubscribe link and. Um, is there a contributed block library available somewhere? Um, well, I know that Mikey did a um, does have a, an extension for Mosaico, um, but um, and he had, in fact I believe that's on on lab.civicrm.org somewhere. So um, I, I'll I'll look for that um, offline and add that to the to the to the shared document. Um, but uh, and that provided a, an enhanced base template, which um, which adds adds some extra blocks. Um, so I'll, I'll have a look for that. Um, and there was a related question about importing templates from other mail services like Mailchimp or Constant Contact. Okay, so um, again, with Mosaico, I'm not aware of any way to to do that directly. Um, Mosaico works from this HTML format and converts to HTML. Um, if you were looking to do something like that, um, really, you, you well, well you, you can do it by using the existing um, 
the, because you've got the two editors available, you've got the traditional editor and the Mosaic editor, you can load the traditional editor and copy and paste um, the HTML directly from a third party into that um, into that box, basically. That would be the, the only way to do that at the moment. Um, and that's one of the nice things that MJML might offer us in the future that um, it appears to be becoming a sort of you know standard interchange format for that for that sort of thing. And, and some of the online services are actually supporting MJML already. So um, I, I don't know if Mailchimp does, but you, know, you, you could imagine a scenario where you could export directly from from Mailchimp in, in MJML format and then into Civi CRM. But um, again, that's a, something for the future. I've added the link for Mikey's VersaFix into the document. So oh, thank you for looking for it, Matt. Thank you. Is Great. There any so I think, uh, Rich, are you, are you now the host and able to share your screen? Excellent. Thank you. So, Rich, you just need to unmute your microphone. Also, if everyone else oh, can go ahead and, and go ahead and mute yourselves, that would be great. Um, thanks for that little tip. Um, yes. Um, so, this is me, and um, I've got, I've got, I've got. I sent a list of stuff that I was going to cover. Um, so um, hopefully you're all here because you're interested in that stuff as well. Um, I'm going to try and do like, uh, I'm going to cover some concepts that you kind of need to know about if you're, if you're interested in this sort of, in wrestling with this sort of stuff. Um, and also at the end, some extensions that uh, most of which I've written, but you may find useful for doing mailings and stuff. Most of my clients use Mosaico um, to send their mailings out from from Civi, um, so um, I'm familiar with with Mosaico too. Um, I'm in a very unprofessional way. I've just got Inkscape here as my slides device with like all of my slides in a big grid. So <laughs> it's not gonna be super slick, but here we go. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So this process, um, by the way, can you, can everybody, if I'm, can you see where my mouse is pointing? Yes, we can see your, where your mouse is pointing. Okay, fab, uh, yeah, I'm never too sure. Right, great. So um, so this is the process that, that we're talking about today is you write something in Civi Mail, which may include Mosaico, um, and then your your mailing system um, will will end up with an SMTP communication to the recipient's SMTP server, and then the recipient may have other things that we don't know about um, filters and policies and anti spam and virus checks who knows what they've got and then eventually uh, it arrives in in the person's inbox which is which is what we hope and want um so what i'm going to be talking about is this bit here your smtp thing and this so this is where you see these sort of companies listed spark post mailjet postmark amazon ses if you like companies that don't pay tax um Elastic email, Mailgun, TV, SMTP, your own server as well. Um, so that's what we're going to be covering mostly, mostly today. Um, so some core concepts that we need to we need to know about then. Um, reputation. What does that mean? Um, so here, this this bit, this blue bit, your SMTP. Um, that's basically going to have an IP address and that IP address is going to be known for sending mail from from you to to Hotmail to Gmail to all of the other mails um, uh, all the other domains you know and and over time um, your IP your so that server's IP or and it may be a little pool of servers but anyway that that server will get a reputation um, so if that IP address is taken over by a spammer and they send out loads and loads of spam, you're going to find it very difficult to send email from that IP because everybody knows that that IP sends loads of spam. 
Um, so um, if you don't send spam, you can still get hit because maybe somebody with the IP number that's in the same neighborhood as your IP numbers, you know, IP numbers, they're like four numbers with dots between. And, you know, if you're, anyway, like if, if the numbers are similar, you're in the same sort of neighborhood and often, often people will block list IPs by a whole group of them, a whole net subnet of them. Um, and you can get caught up in that. Um, so these are things you can't do a lot about, um, except for having your own IP, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but these are the things that affect your reputation. So sending patterns. Um, do you send a regular mail shot out to like a newsletter, for example? I've got I've got ten thousand people. I mail them every week. Um, that's a nice steady pattern. And once you once you up. Once, once uh, you know the, the the Gmails and the Hotmails get used to seeing ten thousand emails, um, or perhaps there's two thousand emails for Hotmail and ten eight thousand emails for Gmail or whatever. Once they get used to seeing you sending that amount of mail on a weekly basis, then they'll they'll say, okay, we you know this is this is fine. We uh, we understand what this person's doing. It all looks legit. It's fine. We'll let it through. They give them a good reputation. Um, if on the other hand, you like me, you run um, lots of sites for campaigns where they might have uh, a petition or something that suddenly goes viral and you get, you know, 30,000 people doing something in a weekend um, and each of those actions generates an email. Um, that's much harder because then the sending pattern is like, oh, look, they've got a regular newsletter. Whoa, what's happened there? Um, they're suddenly sending loads of, loads of email. Um, and that can be enough to trigger, um, particularly Microsoft are uh, very bad at, at, at just going, oh, no, don't, don't trust you anymore. Um, and that's just a pain. Um, so the other, so IP address is one thing and sending domain, um, the, as in the domain that your emails come from is, is the, other, the other thing that, that people will build up your reputation against. Um, it differs across mail account providers. So what do I mean by that? Well, I, I'm asking myself, not you. Um, <laughs> so um, what I mean is that like Gmail will have its own probably machine learning led um, spam detection uh, radar thing for, for giving you a reputation. Um, Hotmail and the other Microsoft ones have got their own. Um, and everybody else has got, got their own as well. Now, there might be some centralized um, block lists that people can uh, subscribe to, either free or paid. Um, and they might do some sort of sharing of like, oh, you know, this, I, this, this IP is doing something dodgy at the minute and they, they might take that on. But basically, each, each male uh, domain um, is going to be doing its own thing. So there isn't really a very easy way to sort of fix something that will fix all of the world receiving email. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind. Um, the content of your emails will also determine your reputation. Um, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's up, up to you. Try not to try not to do the sorts of things that spammers do. Sometimes you can't help that. I've got a client who always insists on including emoji in the subject line. Um, but, uh, but that does score them points for spamminess, um, but they, they think that's worth it. Um, you've got to make your own call. Um, and there's a, there's a spamminess sort of service that you can send email to, um, and it'll tell you how spammy it thinks your email is that may or may not be useful to you. Uh, it's called mailtester.com. Um, anyway, um, recipient behavior inter and interaction. So if everyone you send your emails to clicks the this is junk button or this is unsubscribe button, then those feedback mechanisms may affect your, your reputation depending on the email provider they use. Um, and finally, the other thing that affects your reputation, in fact, that this is one of the most important things really is you're having the proper setup. Um, and this is not, not easy, um, but you to have proper setup with your with your email, you're going to be making changes to your DNS records for your domain um, so that you have DKIM, SPF, PTR, and MX records all, all in place and all 
while working for you. Um, if you don't have these things, your mail may turn up as unauthenticated, um, which is, is not going to help you get through stuff. Yes, MX Toolbox is a good place to check for blacklists. And there's other tools that you can use to check. They will talk to your mail server and, and sort of see if it all looks legit. Um, PTR is a reverse DNS record. So when your server, um, your server's got an IP address of 1.2.3.4, for example, uh, and it tries to send email, the receiving server might say, uh, and it, so one, but your server might try to send email from um, rich.uk and uh, the receiving server might say, oh, I'm going to look up 1.2.3.4. What's its domain name? Um, does, it, does it have a domain name or is it just on, it, on its own? If it's got a domain name and it matches the hello address that the server sent, said, hello, I'm 1.2.3.4, I'm mail.rich.uk. If it matches, then you're more likely to be considered um, proper. If, if it doesn't, um, or if it doesn't have a reverse DNS, then that's more likely to be a, a higher IP for a short period by a spammer or something that they, somebody's taken control over. Anyway, um, right. What are these things then? So these things um, are you, the top two anyway, are used to um, what a lot of mail things like Gmail and whatnot calls authenticate your email. So SPF stands for Sender Protection Framework. Um, it's quite old, but it's still very much in use today. Um, so what this does is it says, does the domain, the, it looks at the domain in the return path. When you send an email, um, as well as you specifying a from address, um, which is your, you know, that'll be your email address that you'll be familiar with. Um, behind the scenes, um, there'll be another thing that looks like an email address called the return path. Um, and that's where, where servers should send rejection messages to. Um, so um, SPF is a system where it says, okay, that the domain that's in that return path, let me look up, let me, let me look up the DNS records for that domain. And it, those will, those, the SPF record will list which servers are allowed to send email coming from that with with that return path um, so that's useful because if somebody tries to send email from my domain from artfulrobot.uk then um, then hopefully um, someone like gmail will say hang on you're not allowed to send this server's not allowed to send email from artfulrobot.uk i think you're a spammer um, spf records have got three outcomes um, yes matches fine um, no, uh, I would like you to reject mail that comes from a different server. So if I have my SPF record set up to, to reject then, and somebody tried to send email from, from my domain, then hopefully it would be rejected. Um, and the third option is, mm, uh, which leaves it, leaves it up to, it sort of says, you do what you want with it, but I'm telling you it doesn't look quite right. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, the, the three sort of options for SPF. DKIM stands for, I can't remember what it stands for. Um, anybody? Put it in the chat if you can remember. Um, domain keys identified mail or something like that. Um, and it's basically a cryptographic signature. They, uh, I told you, well done, Philip. Um, and um, it's a cryptographic signature that's added to your email. Um, to say by your server. And again, it works on DNS. And it, what it means is that when a recipient server get, receives an email, it can um, check that signature was created by your server. And then, and so what, it, what that means is that we know now that this email has come from your server. And therefore, if we trust your server, we can trust that this email looks legit. Um, of course, if we don't trust your server, then that that's a, that's a problem for you. But assuming that you can trust your server and that you haven't been hacked and you haven't ever sent anything spammy, then um, that's a really good way of saying, look, I, I take responsibility for the, for the content of this email um, and I can prove it cryptographically. So that's, that's very, very important to have in place. Um, and yes, and then we have 
DMARC, um, and I really can't remember what that one stands for. It's a very complex thing, and it's not very well implemented by many of the um, email the receiving domains like Gmail and things. Um, so it's it's basically you you as the the person that owns the domain um, saying what should what should you do if you receive an email and one of these doesn't match um, or you know so you could you can set a very strict policy up that says look unless my email comes with the right SPF and the right DKIM stuff I want you to reject it like that would be a very strict thing you probably break quite a lot of things like mail forwarders and mailing lists by doing that but you know that's the ideal of it um, the other thing you can do is, is tell it to just report that to you, but just let it through anyway, or you can tell it to accept it. So that's what DMARC is. DMARC, a lot of email providers, um, you know, I'm talking about uh, Elastic Email, SendGrid, that sort of thing. A lot of them sort of push you to have a DMARC policy, um, but I'm not actually sure that it in any way helps anything. That's my personal opinion on 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 that, and I I think these top two are very important. DMARC, I I could live without that really. Um, but anyway, right, I need to rock it on. Um, so um, transactional and bulk email. Um, transactional. This is receipts, confirmations, reset password links, and thank yous. Typically, unsubscribe doesn't make sense because it's not a subscription. So if you buy something on the internet, you get a receipt as a transactional email. Bulk is everything that's sent by civvy mail. So newsletters or um, appeals, um, all of that sort of stuff where it's sent to a whole load of people and maybe they've replaced your the dear friend with your name with a token. Um, so lots of the same email. For bulk mail people, uh, typically in the in you at least typically and the UK I have to say that um, have to uh, it's often consent you often require consent and I think it's true in Canada as well um, to to send to send bulk email because most of it's considered marketing um, and so this stuff typically does require an unsubscribe link uh, and an unsubscribe link makes sense um, in that context. Um, Civi has got one mailing system for both types, and there may be an extension that adds this, I'm not sure, but you can't use different services for, 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 for transaction on different, different services for bulk. So it all just goes through the same thing, which can have um, dramatic influences on your choice of um, choice of vendor for sending sending your your mail so for example a client of mine had uh, a mailchimp account and mailchimp's got a second part to it called mandrill which lets you send uh, send mail through smtp um, we had a mandrill um, extension so that our civil mail went through mandrill and we were using them as our mailer um, they had a very expensive mailchimp account giving them nearly a thousand pounds a month but, and they'd been doing so for years and years uh, and then all of a sudden MailChimp got wind of the fact that um that that we were sending we were sending stuff from civi mail through through mandrill and they gave us 48 hours to stop doing it or they would they would just delete our account um which was quite quite a shock really um, and they said they'd only given us 48 hours because we were such a good customer of theirs so all that small print that they have when you're looking at these different services is really important another one I came across was elastic email which requires an unsubscribe link on everything including transactional email um, so um, that's a bit of a challenge for Civi um, and I worked on the AML extension to provide a solution to that but if you don't if you didn't have a solution then Elastic Email would add an unsubscribe link in um, for you which would which would just basically mean that it would never send an email to that person Elastic Email wouldn't know you're on your account would never send an email to that person again regardless of of their subscription wishes or or what you've got set up in Civi at all. So understanding those terms and conditions of the particular provider that you um, choose is really important. Um, you can get stung. 
Um, okay. Um, so, uh, why use a third party SMTP relay service? Um, so I think these, these are the reasons that came to mind. Um, you, it can accept and deliver your emails quickly, fast. Um, potentially less work for your server to do. Um, if you are one of these big organizations with tens of servers, then you might not care. If you're a small organization where everything's on one, then you, you might care quite a lot more. Um, and there's, there's less to maintain or be responsible for or have expertise in. It's not easy. Um, that said, why run your own relay? It's not that hard, depending on your skill set. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I ran my own uh, SMTP servers for, that was my standard model of operation for years. And generally it was fine. Um, and I just sort of got, I got fed up with um, having to contact Microsoft um, when they suddenly decided that we were a spammer and they put us on a blacklist and uh, that was, then we couldn't send email and it affected lots and that was a pain to deal with. Um, so, so I wanted to sort of go for the, the third party thing and also to speed things up because you do need a fast, fast system to deliver emails fast. I now get through uh, around, I think it's general sending rate on one of the bigger clients is about 66,000 emails an hour, um, which is not bad. And it, suit, it suits them for their mailing list of about 140,000. Um, why run your own relay? It's free if you <coughs> ignore your time and if you can share an existing server. You've got full control, you've got full access to the logs. So when something goes wrong and uh, you can really get into the nitty gritty of what happened, um, it's ethical. Uh, email is a distributed communication system. Um, you should be able to do it. Like that's the whole concept. Anybody should be able to follow the protocols, run their own email server. It's actually bad news that 60% of email is lives in Gmail. Like that's, that's not actually a good thing for the world. So, you know, there are reasons to run your own, um, but these, Top reasons are also quite um, convincing. Um, this question came up before the before the event. Should I use Civi Mail and Mosaic Hope, or should I use Mailchimp and sync it with Civi? And uh, this is my strong opinion. Uh, you should use Civi Mail and Mosaic Hope. <laughs> um, sync is phenomenally complex and troublesome. Civi does segmenting better in many ways because you've got all of that data that you've got in your CRM at your fingertips. You know, you, you can do your complex queries on contributions or this, uh, you know, groups they're in or activities they've done. And it's all there. You don't have to worry about trying to export it and shove it up into a flat table structure for, for, um, for MailChimp to, to work on. Um, it's not that hard to learn Mosaico as a user, um, especially once you get your map showed us the, the Mosaico, Mosaico templates, it's called under the mailings um, drop down menu. Um, once you've got those set up, um, then it, you know, it's very quick and easy to make, the, make a standard newsletter. And MailChimp costs a fortune when you get big. As I mentioned earlier, it can easily rise to a thousand pounds a month for a big list. Um, but MailChimp does do A-B testing better. It's got some user-friendly automations and many people come move between organizations with some skills that they carry and it get, makes them feel confident that they can do their, do their job without having to learn something. And so if you are, you know, so there is a, there is a it is a different and it is a learning curve. I think it's very much worth it. Um, but, um, but, you know, we, we, have to, we have to recognize these things as well. And, that's why I put it on the list. Um, right then, where have I gone to? Uh, okay, so, um, and sorry, I, I feel like I'm really rattling through this, but um, I'm just gonna take it that that's okay, uh, unless anybody tells me to like, slow down or anything. So now I wanted to give you an overview of what, how information gets back to Civi when something goes wrong. Ah, oh, there's a block missing there. I hope I've got that drawn on another one. Oh, I haven't. Okay, um, I've lost a I've lost a piece of my picture. Anyway, uh, in this little gap here, there's supposed to be 
a block that says uh, an, an inbox, a mail, an email account. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. So um, in, this, in this diagram, there's various ways that things can loop back. So if you're using, um, if you're using your own, um, uh, sorry, a third party mailing uh, provider, then usually they will have, um, they will allow you to configure, um, they might call it web hooks or something like that, where when something happens, like a bounce is received, um, it sends a message in its own proprietary format to, to a URL that Civi handles. And so the extension for that particular service uh, out that you installed on Civi CRM will listen on that web address. Um, and it will then process the process the message. So, you know, uh, Elastic Email says, oh, I got a bounce. Uh, it's a hard bounce. Civic goes, oh, a hard bounce, you say. OK, I'll put that person's email on hold uh, right now. Thanks very much. And I'll record it as a bounce in the mailing, in the mailing table. Um, likewise, further down the chain, after it's passed out of your SMTP server, uh, it could be received or rejected by the next SMTP server. So that might be Gmail's SMTP server. Now that Gmail might immediately reject your, your mail. You might say, no, 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 no way. You have that back. Um, in which case your SMTP thing deals with it. Or it might get, it might get bounced back later, like days later, or um, you know, it might say, I'm gonna accept this and I'll, I'll try and deliver it, um, but I don't know how it's gonna go. Um, in this block that we don't know about, there can be this can be things like filters that users have set up. You know, um, somebody chooses to have chooses to to block your, you know, say I just don't want any more emails from this person, and um, and and that might that might cause a bounce, or it might just cause it to be deleted, depending on how they set it up. So they, yeah, or finally from the email in somebody's inbox, they can press. Uh, the junk button, the spam button, and that might trigger some bounce message. There's two different um, sort of, uh, and they might press unsubscribe, which would take you to a Civi CRM unsubscribe page or the opt out page. The missing block here is um, is a an email account. So if you run your own your own SMTP server, you normally what that thing that that return path address. Which, that I mentioned earlier is where all of this lot's going to send their complaints to if they've got a complaint to make. And that's then going to, so it's like a bounce address. So you'd normally have, um, you, this, this part would normally collect all that in and stick it in a, stick it in a mailbox. And then civi has got a system which can check, uh, every time cron runs, can check that, that mailbox and say, oh, let's have a look what's in there. Let's rummage through and find things that look like bounces and try to parse them, try to understand what sort of a bounce is that? Um, where, which mailing did it come from? Which email do I need to put on hold if I'm gonna do that? That sort of thing. So it can do its own parsing of messages that have bounced back. That, um, so different SMTP services will either offer a route like this, which is over HTTP, or a route like this, where it'll deliver the bounce message to another inbox and then Civi can pick it up. Okay. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is, I got slides for all that, what I just said. That's good, isn't it? Um, that's annoying. Anyway, um, I think we've covered all the, Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, this is. I'll just. This is a good reminder for me. Um, so on this part of it, then. So um, your server could be on a third party or or local to this block list. Um, your email could look at this, look like spam. And I'm put at that at that moment because what looks like spam um, changes minute to minute. Um, you know. Um, People like Gmail and Microsoft, uh, they, have, they, have, they have sort of rate limiting, throttles, quotas, predicted numbers, things through. All of these things can change at any moment. If, 
if there's a whole load of spam flooding across the internet, then these filters will be tighter and you'll be more likely to be rejected. But it might not happen if you do it next week, for example. Uh, Rich, um, I just want to do a, a quick time check. We mm. only have about three minutes left. Um, would you be able to answer just a few questions if anybody yeah. wanted to unmute themselves? And maybe we can share. I don't know if there's a way to share a link to this document. Or, yeah, I I can do, I, yeah, I can. I can make it into a big JPEG or something. So, um, yeah, I, I've got a bunch of extensions that are quite useful for doing everything from um, segmenting to to reporting. Um, and I was going to show the massive price difference in providers depending on how many emails you send as well. So that's in there. And then you can go and you can go and look at that later. And um, yeah. That bye sounds bye. awesome. Thank you so much for all your hard work and putting all this mm -hmm. together. It's just such a invaluable resource to everyone. Um, any final questions? So I noticed Rich? a question Thoughts? from Luca um, about Apple Mail's unsubscribe requests. Yeah, so that's a, that's a case of when um, you press the button and, and Apple Mail sends an email um, to the bounce, to the list unsubscribe address. And that's one that people often miss when they install a third party mailer um, because the third party mailer might not see that. It, the list unsubscribe will always be whatever Civi sets up. Whereas this, the, the SMT, P mailer will probably usually change the return path and handle it itself. But that is a case when, so if it's not working, yes, it's because you need to put in place this missing block bit here, which is an email account that those all bounce back, they all land back into. And then Civi, you need to configure Civi to look there for bounces. But, so it looks uh, like um, Edwin had a question about the price comparison. Maybe we can quickly go over that. Yeah, I mean, um, so I did this back in November um, last year um, when I was looking for myself. Um, so this is the number of emails that he sent from 10,000 down to 2 million. Um, and then these were all the, these were the few that I, the company products that I looked at and the colors are how expensive it is. Um, so what you notice is that, you know, if you're somebody that, jumps around a lot in your sending then, or, or is trying to grow, then you might need to be prepared to swap senders quite often. Um, elastic email, very, very cheap. You see all that green over there. Um, but yeah, very cheap, but they don't have good deliverability rate. I've actually moved one client off of, off of there because we just couldn't, we were just getting too many bounces. Um, and um, yeah, so, um, so there are, yeah, there is, there are big price differences and they keep going up. They keep changing them, changing them for like a certain fixed amount and some, you know, compared with a per email and including different, they make it quite difficult to compare. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things I was going to say here is that um, uh, they, they often give the impression that they're going to manage your reputation, but they usually are more interested in manage their own reputation um so like elastic email for example will will bounce you down into lower lower quality pools um ip pools um if they you know and you start off in a quite quite poor one so even if, yeah so it's quite hard you know these these things happen automatically you don't get notifications you suddenly notice that you've got a load of bounces um so it yeah these third parties they don't solve everything Thank you so much, Rich. I know we're pretty much at time. If if you could um, create the JPEG and either insert it into the collaborative notes document or send it yeah. to me, I can add it there. Yeah. I, and then also if you can share your contact info that way people yeah. can follow up if they have questions. Sorry, there was a question from Edwin about SendGrid or he says that it's, getting very high in terms of cost yeah um yeah that i mean that's the thing is like you 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 sign up with one and because it's such a headache to get all the config done they then go and email you and like you know i was with uh man mail no 
one of male gun and they suddenly said yeah we're, we're going to bump you up for 30 30 dollars a month from from what was zero dollars a month and some free emails and then you know and there's nothing you can do <laughs> do about it um so yeah they did do that um, great yeah well thank you again rich this is very invaluable thanks to everyone who was able to join us uh, rich if you could go down to the bottom and yeah. uh, stop the cloud recording okay since you're the host yeah and then um we'll share this with everyone afterwards hopefully in the civi youtube channel and uh stay tuned